The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Chris McDaniel, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio today is... Jason Rosenbaum of the St. Louis Beacon. And... Joe Manis with the St. Louis Beacon. And our special guest this week... Senator Joe Kevening. Now, Senator, uh, as we talked about beforehand, your district actually encompasses where Jason and I live. Well, we live in different places, but... The but it's in the in which, city of St. Louis. Yes, you, the you are the official which... state senator of two of the three members of the Politically Speaking <laughs> podcast crew. We need to lobby the third one. <laughs> I, I don't think Joe's getting out of Webster. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in Webster Groves. <laughs> well, um, the district's a very diverse district. It basically goes from Riverview and Highway 270 right. um, down Kings Highway. It veers a little bit east of Kings Highway. And then it cuts across South St. Louis into Delore, and then uh, it goes down to 55 and River to Pear. So I have everything in the, in the city south and west of Kings Highway. And then I pick up Shrewsbury, the south side of Clayton, Richmond Heights, and Brentwood. So I go all the way out to McKnight and Highway 40. And you have one very good Chinese restaurant that is a block away from my house that is also within the purview of your district. My favorite Chinese <laughs> restaurant, yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You have some very impressive credentials for a state senator. You're a JD and an MBA. Well, unusual. I got to tell you a little bit about my family, too, then. Um, I'm married, been married for 32 years. I've got uh, four kids, and my baby's 24 years old. So they're all growing up and out of the house. My career is in banking. I do have an MBA from St. Louis U and my JD from St. Louis U. I got my MBA in 86 and my JD in 1997. I'd been interested in politics since I've been 18 years old. My parents died when I was in college, and I got married straight out of college and then started having kids right away. And even though I was interested, I just couldn't afford it. <laughs> but four kids, I don't <laughs> think Four so. kids, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sent them to parochial schools. You know, the kids grew up. I was at the bank. I started Mercantile Bank, and it went on to First Star and then on to U.S. Bank. and went from a, a homegrown bank to a, a national bank. I was traveling a lot. The, my predecessor resigned his office early. Yeah, the infamous Jeff, Jeff Smith. Smith. Yes. yes. And we say that tongue-in-cheek. We love yes, you, Jeff Smith, yes, by yes. the way. Yes, <laughs> we hope to have him on the podcast. Um, so, you know, the position opened up. I had been a committeeman. I served on the Central Committee for probably six or eight years at the time. And just to explain for a second, commit, there, are, there are 28 wards, and each ward has two committee men, one, one male and one female member. Right. And, and, yeah, e- and when each Smith, party. And when Smith had to resign because he was going to prison, the party leaders in these township it, in the wards within the district then pick a nominee. Based on the number of precincts that you have in the district. Correct. Correct. I just want to— Explain that. Yeah, it, it's it, it's a it, it's a complicated process. My twenty eighth ward, we probably had ten precincts in the four senatorial district. Some wards only had one or two, so I was the committeeman for the twenty eighth ward, so I had ten votes. Yeah, and and there is a kind of an interesting subplot to how you got the nomination over uh, now former state representative Rachel Storch. One of the key swing votes was. Then committee woman Sharon Titus, now alder woman Sharon Titus. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that came about? You know, Sharon, Sharon and I um, get along very, very well. Sharon and I picked it up uh, from the, really the first time that we met. She perceives me to be a very genuine person, a very truthful person, and she she places a lot of trust in me. So, um, if you remember that vote in the very beginning, I didn't have her vote. No, she was Correct. supporting uh, Gerald Christmas, who was a staffer for U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill. That's correct. And what happened was uh, when she told me that I wouldn't, um, that she couldn't support me on the first ballot, I immediately came back and said, well, will you re- support me on the second one? And she did. And she gave me her word that she would, and she did. And I think that was a pretty decisive moment, and that's probably one of the reasons you're a state senator right now. That, that's the reason that I got elected to a Sharon Tyus 
and Norma Leggett right. and James Claiborne and yes. Sterling. And I think one of the reasons why that was such an interesting situation, and Joe probably wrote about it at the time. Yeah, is I did because I was there. You were endorsed by Mayor Slay to take over Jeff Smith's seat. And obviously, Sharon Tyus and Mayor Slay have had a history that's not, not so good. But as you just mentioned, because of what happened and the fact that you were able to get that commitment for the second vote, um, she managed to put things over the edge for you despite that complicated history with Slay. So that's one of the more interesting uh, stories in city politics that we've seen, for sure. Right. I'm, I'm very happy the way that it worked out. Sharon and I still serve on the state committee together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, since then, though, you I mean, you've re- actually gotten a pretty strong reputation in the state Senate for the bills that you've pushed. And um, Well, thank you. Um, I, I pushed some complicated bills. If, if you remember, when I was elected, I'm, all the talk was I was the sponsor for the local control of St. Louis Police Department. Correct. And that took, that took a lot of time and effort. And we, we filed it for two years, and we, and we just couldn't get it done. Um, but as a result of that, uh, some of the more complicated bills, um, people come to me and ask me to do them. Um, I'm a trust and probate attorney. Can I give my firm a little plug here? Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. For Wise Attorneys at Law. Thank you, David Wise and Jim, Jim Noah Grocky. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I pass a lot of, of, of trust bills for the Missouri Bar. Um, you know, a lot of things that normal people don't understand, but it affects all their lives. So, uh, you know, I can steer those through and various other ones. I think I passed three bills last session. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you. You know, obviously the Democrats are in the minority in the Big Missouri minority. Senate. I Big think there's minority. there's 10. 24 Democrats, to 10. Yeah. And 24 yeah. to 10. Yeah. But I've noticed in recent years the Republicans have been giving a little bit more leeway to Democrats to sponsor bills that actually make it through the process. This was not the case during the blunt years when right. Democrats generally got shut out. Do you feel like you have a better opportunity to pass a lot of bills, especially ones that are important to St. Louis in the Missouri Senate? I do. I do. I mean, there are bills that I file that uh, I'm going to have ideological opposition from, and those aren't going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do feel compelled to file them. And there are bills that I file for for you know the good of the city of St. Louis or for the Missouri Bar that I get plenty of leeway for. And the Republican majority, those type of bills, they really work with me. And one other fun fact before we get into the issues. During the veto session, and I may be wrong on this, but I think you were the only senator to vote against every override uh, who was a Democrat, if I'm not mistaken. Did you get like a, a trophy for that after that? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the veto session, the governor vetoed uh, 29. 29, 20, bills. 29 bills. Yes. And I think we brought up probably 17. Yes. Sounds about right. Um some of the bills, uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of reasons why I didn't vote to override the governor. Um, some of the bills, number one, I got to commend this governor for what he did on 253. He got out there. That's the sale. That's the, uh, the income tax, tax cut, cut bill, yeah, the yeah, the which we've talked bill. about ad nauseum on right. this show. Yeah, so, continue. Uh, you know, I felt I owed him a duty of allegiance just for his efforts on that. Some of the other bills, um, I didn't think we should have even overridden. And um, some of the other bills were, were um, you know what, bring it back next year. Just bring back a better bill. You know, pay attention to what it got. Well, when we get down to the end of session, it's, we're cramming a lot of bills through. We, we, we spend, we, we don't spend near the time I think we should analyzing some of these bills. So, and the governor has all summer to, to, to analyze them. So when he has a veto, um, we ought to pay attention to what he says. And maybe there is something inherently wrong with the bill. So I gave that a lot of deference. So, Senator, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, your district goes pretty far north. So you have you have some some skin in the game, so to speak, as far as the school transfer situation. We have a couple months before the session comes back. What's the progress that you've seen? What's the talk that you've had with your fellow senators in terms of what changes are going to be made for the school transfer law? Well, uh, what changes... Hopefully, will be made. Um, <laughs> what changes you hope will be made? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, we're still in the discussion stage. We're talking, the ideas are, as you can imagine, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, we talk about accreditation for schools within a district versus the entire district. Talk, I mean, every topic that uh, you can imagine on an education bills probably going to come into play when we go to fix this transfer issue. 
I will say the rhetoric has toned down Im- yes. immensely since the day that the court passed that decision. And the Riverview Gardens and Normandy have have uh, p- chosen their, their transfer points. Um, that being said, now that the rhetoric's toned down, we're starting to have some rational discussions. Um, mm-hmm. it's, not so, it's not so much... Uh, you know, my way or no way and things like that. There's, I think there's lots of room for compromise here. It's just a matter of, you know, th- there are a lot of vested interests. It's, it's gonna, if we pass a bill, it's going to be a bill that probably nobody likes. Yeah. Um, or I won't say nobody likes, but nobody's overly enamored with it. So, You heard it here first. <laughs> yes, that, that everyone will be unhappy. Well, so you've <laughs> talked about, uh, you know, how we can fix this broken law. What, what are the aspects that you think are broken? Well, um, just the the overall – I mean, we have to provide a quality education for every kid, bar none. That, that's what's broken. We're not doing that. Now, how we do that is it transfer all the kids in the district to a different district. I'm not convinced that's the answer. Is it, is it uh, transfer the good teachers from a successful district into a very, very challenged district? You know, I'm not sure that's the answer either because – those teachers probably don't have any ex- kind of experience to teach those kids in the in the in the challenge district. That's that's what we have to work on. We have to provide the product. We have to do it so it's economically feasible. And if the state has to kick in some additional money, the state's going to need to have to kick in some additional money. But we got to take the vested interest out of the equation and focus on the kids. And if we hurt somebody's feelings, we hurt somebody's feelings. Now, one idea that's been floated, and I think this is especially applicable to the city of St. Louis, is that instead of judging accreditation by district, it would be by particular school. And the reason why I mentioned the St. Louis City example is while everyone has this assumption that the city of St. Louis school district is just universally terrible, that is definitely an oversimplification because there are public schools in the city, which some of them are rated the best in the state, other than are not so highly rated. Is that kind of an idea that may gain some traction, or is that going to have the same types of problems as transferring from kids from one district to another? Well, I think that will get some traction. That will get a lot of discussion. Um, with the rollout of MSIP 5, Desi is going to keep track of not only the district, but the schools within the district. So Desi will be able to tell us. In what, school testing. In school testing. Yeah. So Desi will be able to tell us what schools are doing well and what schools aren't doing so well. Now, if if we have to work this out, we don't know if we're going to classify, if we're going to declare the whole district unaccredited and let kids move from the poorer schools to the better schools or transfer teachers from the better schools to the poorer schools, or if we're going to do it only by school if we, if we uh, unaccredit a single school and have those kids go to other schools. This is all stuff that we're talking about now. Now, do you think – now, in 2011, we were kind of discussing this before the show. There was an effort to institute a quote-unquote Turner fix, which was the code name or the the shorthand for basically changing this transfer law where school districts could limit the amount of students that could come to a district if they're transferring. That got kind of ensnared in – education reform issues. Our our previous guest, Jane Cunningham, when she was a state senator, was involved in that issue and was pretty adamant that any Turner fix had to include a lot of things that were controversial, whether it be tuition tax credits or changes to the way teachers are tenured. Do you think that a similar situation is going to occur with this debate as well? I think those issues are going to be ensnared in this debate, yes. Um, Whether we can marginalize some of those more extreme reforms. If, if we're going to focus on the transfer situation in St. Louis, then we need to marginalize some of those more extreme reforms. If we're going to open this all up to the whole state and, 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 uh, and the, per, the perceived problems with some of these rural districts, and Kansas City's got problems too, then it's going to be ripe for those kind of discussions. Now, aren't some of the rural legislators a little more interested in trying to do something that doesn't go that far because now that they're seeing, I mean, now that this is happening and there's been this controversy, so you've had some suburban legislators, especially in St. Charles County, who aren't keen on it, uh, might there be, I guess, more of an aggressive effort 
to make some changes because the rural legislators see that this does affect them because of what you just said. That's correct. That's correct. And that's that's why I think we will have the discussion with some of these other issues, but if we're going to if we're going to do the transfer issue, um, I think some of that will will be uh, some of that discussion will be truncated because more people now are concerned about fixing this transfer issue than were in the past. Um, you know, we have 520 school districts in the state. Um, if we're busing kids all over the state, it's going to be a real mess. How do you see the fund the funding situation playing out? Because right now you have unaccredited districts paying a lot of money to bus kids to accredited districts. Those kids that get bused now that they are at a different school, if they get a good education, their testing won't be counted for the unaccredited districts. So you have unaccredited districts paying a lot of money when they won't necessarily be seeing the impact of it improving their district's test scores. How do you see this funding playing out? I know that Normandy and Riverview Gardens are both seeing some problems there. I think that Riverview Gardens, which is more in your district, has much more money saved up than Normandy does, though. I think that that statement's accurate. Um, and again, this is this is this is a very fluid topic. Um, yeah, the Vic charges the voluntary inter district transfer program charges one amount. Each of the school districts charge their own amount for tuition, and then on top of that, each of the districts charge for their building facilities. So, is it fair to send the Normandy kids have them pay for the for the for the facilities in 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 Kirkwood? Um, I don't know. They should be paying something for, for tuition, obviously. Um, you know, what's the correct amount? I'm, we're we're still discussing that, um, but there's there, there's a lot of things that come into play on this. Um, if if we're not requiring the receiving districts to to add to their plant, then their incremental cost is minimal for taking the additional kits. Mm-hmm. So. There's a lot of room to play here. Um, I don't think anybody's got the answer yet. So I, I know this is an issue that there's going to have to be – you're going to have to be working with a lot of Republicans on this issue. How, how has that been so far? Are you satisfied with what you've been hearing from your Republican colleagues? Pretty much. Pretty much. You know, the, the, everybody is – you know, there are some issues that we're going to be ideologically opposed to. Right. Um, the vouchers for one. Um, maybe the teacher tenure. Um, but, you know, um, pretty much everybody's focused on we don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to but we're going to solve this. We're going to figure out a way. We're going to get together and we're going to figure out a way to make everybody whole on this thing. To make everyone unhappy. To make everybody unhappy. <laughs> exactly. No one will be happy. So let's <laughs> switch gears a little bit to another topic. Yeah, another one that's going to be gonna coming be, up going to probably be a big issue next year and um, uh, also a meaty topic. This was the subject of a show that we were on yesterday on the Nine Network. Yes. In the page for the show, I'll, I'll be sure to link out to the Nine Network show last night that was about and Medicaid expansion. And we're talking about the M word, Medicaid yeah. <laughs> See, if he, expansion. If he, can, if he can promote his business, we can promote <laughs> ours. Yeah. Well. yeah. And uh, I have a story on the Beacon site now because the governor earlier today um, – He's a, calling a meeting. Yeah, he's calling a meeting or at least asking. He can't necessarily yeah. call a meeting in the legislature. He can just ask if some members of the two committees in the Senate and the House that have been focusing on Medicaid will show up and talk to him. Now, it's unclear if they will. The senator was one of the ones invited. Correct. I will be there. So, so the question is, is he didn't actually use the E word expansion in the letter. But the reading between the lines, the implication was that he was going to try to make another pitch for it. I'm interested in your take on what do you think the intent of the meeting is, whether or not you think there's going to be any receptiveness among Republicans who previously have been opposed to it, but there seems to be at least some softening in some quarters. I think the purpose of the meeting is is for the governor to explain some of the ramifications that were that are going on as a result of of us not expanding it yet and what we can expect going forward. Um, now, that's an assumption on my part. Okay. Um, as, as we know, Connect Care just closed mm-hmm. um, right. as a result of not ex- non-expansion. Now, what do I expect in, in expansion? Um, again, this is going to be tough. We're talking about possibly managed care for the Medicaid, um, possibly 
prescription drug monitoring for the Medicaid. We're the only state in the country that doesn't have prescription drug monitoring. Part of the reform that I've heard in testimony is people are concerned that, that people on Medicaid are selling their prescription drugs. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what we want to reform. Well, how do you do that without having pre- prescription drug monitoring? Right. So, um, and there was, there's one individual in the Senate that is completely opposed to prescription drug monitoring. Yes. We discussed gonna, him. That was going to be my next question. Rob Schaff of St. Joseph. A physician. I, a physician who I seem to always bring up when we talk about Medicaid. But I do think he's an important figure in this debate, not only because of that, but because on the Senate floor he has put very specifically – and everybody who listens to this show knows what question I'm about to ask, that Medicaid expansion will not even be discussed in his view unless you attach getting rid of certificate of need and price transparency. Have you heard anything in the committee about that? And do you think acceding to those demands are a willing price to pay for Medicaid expansion? Uh, The second question first, acceding to those demands, I don't think it's a good price to pay, no. Why? Um, we need to we need to work with Senator Schaff to 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 compromise away some of those demands. We need to soften that. Um, I don't want to have an individual hold Medicaid expansion hostage for his own personal view. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the other question I have not heard, and I do serve with Senator Schaff on the Mo Hefnet Oversight Committee also. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we've – and we've had this discussion in front of the Mole Health and Oversight Committee. Um, he doesn't – he's not optimistic that we'll get any expansion done, which is why I, I sincerely hope that he's at, with the, at the meeting with the governor on the 26th. Oh, I'm sure he will be. Yeah. Because I'm sure he's going to raise all these things that he's been mentioning for well, years. Well, is he on one of these committees? Yeah, he's on the Transformation okay, okay, Committee with me. Okay. But my – this is why I bring up this topic, and I mentioned this on the show. The hospitals are putting forth this proposition. It's probably a, a reasonable assumption that if they don't get this Medicaid expansion money, a lot of them are going to shut down or well, – Which is or, what's happening with Connect or, or, you know, lay off staff. So if the way forward to possibly – not absolutely because he hasn't said, for example, that he'll pass Medicaid expansion if you do those things. But isn't that a willing – isn't it – worth considering changing certificate of need or doing price transparency if the re- other result is hospitals shutting down or laying off staff? Oh, you, sure, sure. I mean, I'm, I may have misspoke. I just um, – we can have that discussion, mm-hmm. and we can probably com- form some kind of compromise. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, I learned very early in my career, um, y- you always got to give a guy a way out. Yeah. I, I bring this up because this might – Possibly, I'm being, I'm saying possibly, putting that caveat because it's not for sure. That could possibly be a way to get that through the Senate. That's why I keep asking people that question. I, I don't think the hospital industry is going to like either of those things, but it's a possibility to bring up. So. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, it could be that uh, uh, Senator Schaff agrees to some sort of compromise where it doesn't totally do those things, or depending on the climate. There's always the possibility that the Senate leadership would um, PQ and block, I mean, you know, and a filibuster. I mean, this is all iffy, depends on kind of right. what sort of bill comes out of the House. Yes, we're being very hypothetical here, yeah. I'm politically speaking today. Yeah. But it's an important, but, but when we talk about process here, I mean, the, 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 the these types of things matter with getting a, a, an important bill like this through. So, right. I, I mean, transparency on it just by itself. I mean, that shouldn't be offensive to hardly anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the hospital association shouldn't, shouldn't should, even though, I mean, it, your definition of transparency and the hospital association's definition of transparency could be two vastly different yeah, things. Yeah, and that's, again, kind of a shorthand, and I believe that that proposal is prompting hospitals to give prices for medical procedures, if I'm not mistaken. I could be explaining that a little bit wrongly, but I can, that's, Essentially, what I'm talking about. Yeah, he he wants to be able to. If I remember the discussion correctly, um, he wants to be able to. My person walks in the hospital wants to be able to know what how much is going to cost me to get my appendicitis taken care of and things like that. Yeah. So, but but, but overall, how optimistic or pessimistic yeah. are you that something will come out on this issue? Well, I'm optimistic. Um, 
again, I'm in the minority. I, I, I go to work optimistic. Uh, are you optimistic for this session, though, or are you optimistic for eventually? Eventually really um, isn't as important as doing it this year or next year. I mean, Because that's where the federal money that's is. That's where now. the federal money is. And um, we talked, you know, I've had discussions about, about the waivers. And, you know, I wouldn't expect a waiver from the federal government until after the state's picking up some of the tab. So um, I think it's important to do it now. Um, the hospitals are, are and, and the acute care centers and the employees, they need the expansion. Are Mo- you, most important, the peop- the citizens need the expansion. Are you seeing any heightened pressure? I mean, uh, in the last few months, I covered one of the interim committee hearings, the one that was in St. Louis, and so what was interesting to me was that there were so many people who testified, and of course they were all for expansion, um, and of course it was because, in part, because it was in an urban setting where you have more supporters, <clears throat> you have a lot more hospital officials, and a lot of uh, people who are in line with this. But the Missouri Chamber of Commerce says that they're still on board with pressing expansion, although they didn't press it that hard last session. But I guess my 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 question is, from what you're seeing so far, and we're like what uh, a little less than two months away from the from the session starting, are you seeing any sort of tenor either from the hospitals or the business community or other groups to try to change the dynamics um, as far as trying to persuade Republicans to change their stance on this? I have not seen that. Um, okay. Now, in the Senate, we didn't go around the state. We stayed in Jefferson City. We had three hearings. Correct. Mm-hmm. Each each one of the hearings was was it was a full house, um, and he broke it up by category. So we had the suppliers, and then we had the demand, and I forgot what the third one was. Um, so even at the last hearing, there were there were those senators that were just by their tone, they were going to be reluctant to expand. Right. So we're th- th- these next two or three months. The goal of the committee is to have a a draft of a bill before we go into session. So you're going to start to see the the pressure mount now. Okay. Now um, you're you're up for reelection next year. Yes. And I right. just want to make sure, in, in case we want to make see uh, why news, you are running for reelection next year. I am running for reelection next year. Now I ask this to every person in a heavily Democratic or heavily Republican uh, district, do you expect to face a significant primary, or do you think it might be a situation where it's nominal opposition or you're unopposed? I have not heard of anybody filing um, against me yet. Uh, Filing opens the end of February and closes the end of March. A Senate district's a very large district. Yes. 180,000 people. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Mm-hmm. to to c- conduct a Senate campaign. Um, I would think that if there was someone out there that was seriously contemplating it, they'd already be out there working it. Now, also, uh, quick, if you, okay, you've got one more session before the election. Um, are there any other particular issues you're going to be pushing? One of the things that it, people have been talking about is whether or not you might be sponsoring some more bills uh, in line with uh, the view of Mayor Francis Lay to eliminate or change uh, some of the city's so-called county offices, you know, to make them either appointed or whatever. That's already happened. Because he sponsored legislation to make the circuit clerk, am I pronouncing that, and the public administrator non-elected positions. Yes, and and that's now the case. And one of the things that uh, my alderwoman, Donna Berenger, is putting forward in her possible uh, bid for license collector is eliminating the license collector as an elected position. We kind of talked a little bit about this before the show. Is that the next uh, thing to potentially go? Well, you know, the license collector position, um, no one has approached me other than your alderwoman about eliminating that. Um, I I will tell you, the circuit clerk, that discussion had been going on for... For years, for for years. 12 or 16 years. With the judges, yes. Maybe possibly prompted by my neighbor, Mariano Favaz's performance. (laughs) And uh, as for the public administrator, the current public administrator actually came to me and asked me to do that. Um, Because the the way that we operate our public administrator office in the city, we don't do it very well. We don't do it very efficiently. It's a fee office, and the estates that he handles aren't don't generate enough fees 
the county office is about three times the size of the of the city. Mm-hmm. So we and the first step to get to a, a a properly run office is to make him an appointed position so they can hire him and or him or somebody else and give him a budget and let him properly do the office. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. To close us out here, you can read all of my stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can read all of Joe and Jason's stories at stlbeacon.org. You can follow me on Twitter at adcsmcdaniel. You can follow Jason on Twitter at... Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Joe on Twitter. At Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And you can follow the senator on Twitter at... At Joe Kevening. Very good. Well, we'll be back next week. Until then, so long. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.